Ladies and gentlemen, in a few minutes uh, we will begin the program. Uh, in the meantime, uh, if you take a moment to mute any devices that you have uh, and uh, try and keep the, the chatter down to a relative minimum, the, the uh, various parts of the campus are, are getting the, the program streamed and so it's easier to hear that way. All right, but we're going to start in about, uh, about two minutes. Should we go? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kevin Wagner. I'm the director of the Jack Miller Forum for Civic Engagement. I'm also the chair of the Political Science Department at Florida Atlantic University. I want to, if you can join me in recognizing some of our uh, distinguished guests here today, including former president of the League of Women Voters, Karen Wilkerson. I also want to thank the League that continues to support and sponsor our Constitution Day events. Uh, Dr. Larry Fairman, the Acting Vice President of Student Affairs and Enrollment Management. And Dr. Michael Horswell of the Dorothy F. Schmidt College of Arts and Letters, the Dean. We at FAU are delighted to partner with the League of Women Voters of Palm Beach County, which helped underwrite this event. If you're not registered, the League has voter registration uh, available in the lobby, at least I hope so. On behalf of Florida Atlantic University, welcome to the FAU Constitution Day celebration and the 8th annual Robert J. Balin Symposium on the First Amendment. We'd like to thank all of our sponsors and partners, including the League of Women Voters, the Dorothy F. Schmidt College of Arts and Letters, the Department of Political Science, the School of Communication and Multimedia Studies, and the Division of Student Affairs. Mezzo-soprano and adjunct professor of voice Monica Hidalgo will perform our national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. Everyone, please rise. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we've watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag 
jaguar still there? Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? I want to thank Professor Hidalgo, who uh, has been singing the national anthem for us on Constitution Day pretty much uh, almost every time, I think. Yeah, almost every time. And it, uh, it's, uh, it's always beautiful. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Constitution Day is my favorite holiday. Um, unsurprising for a political science professor, but an important holiday. And I really appreciate that everyone's here to help celebrate it with us. Benjamin Franklin once said this about our supreme law, the Constitution. He said, the Constitution only gives people the right to pursue happiness. You have to catch it yourself. Well, this was said a long time ago with his usual wit. Franklin's point is still pretty important. The Constitution provides a path, but it's just a document if we don't understand it and fight to preserve the rights and liberties that it speaks to. Our Constitution is understudied, ignored, and often misunderstood. Constitution Day was created thanks to the late Senator Robert Byrd of West Virginia, who always carried a copy of the Constitution. Senator Byrd uh, put forward legislation in Congress in 2004 that mandated that all education institutions receiving federal funds hold an educational program celebrating the United States Constitution. As a result, each September we commemorate the signing of one of the most remarkable political documents ever written. This day is more important than it appears. The U.S. Constitution is the blueprint for our society and for modern democracies everywhere. Yet study after study shows the American people have a surprisingly poor knowledge of the Constitution. In a recent poll, 7 out of 10 Americans did not know the Constitution was the supreme law of the land. Large majorities could not name the length of a Senate term or the number of members of the House or even what the three branches of our federal government are. It's not just disappointing that most Americans know more about the legal woes of Britney Spears than our founding documents. It is a real problem. The people lack the basic skills of citizenship. If they do not know the rights and duties of a citizen of the United States, then the very foundation of our democracy is vulnerable. Citizens need to know the Constitution, not just to honor the great Americans that came before us, but to exercise the sovereignty and authority that the Constitution vests within them. Here at Florida Atlantic University, the Jack Miller Forum for Civic Education, the Division of Student Affairs, the Dorothy F. Schmidt College of Arts and Letters, the School of Communication, and the Department of Political Science have worked hard to make FAU celebration of Constitution Day among the best in the country. Our program has been highlighted and recognized by state and national leaders. But it is the support from people like you, the League of Women Voters, and like Robert J. Balin that made this all possible. So thank you for coming, participating, and joining us in celebrating the United States Constitution. Our celebration of the Constitution would not be what it is today without Robert J. Balin. Robert Balin was an editor at newspapers from New Hampshire to Alabama. He and his wife, Inez, who was also a journalist, retired to Palm Beach, and Bob began teaching at FAU and later served on the advisory board for the FA University Press. Devoted to his profession, he established the endowment for the annual symposium on the First Amendment. We lost Robert Balin in the last two years ago, but his vision and commitment to our Constitution and our program here at FAU continue to inspire each of us every day. We have a short video to show you. When this building, the <coughs> Culture and Society building, was being planned, 
Uh, it was also plans for Democracy Plaza, where we're standing now, uh, and it had been customary to uh, have some kind of art or sculpture involved with a building. And I was uh, thinking of uh, something that would be symbolic, uh, something that would be educational, and would fit in with the theme. We uh, decided to do the, a, a mural such as you have here. But one of the things that I, 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 I chose to emphasize the, the First Amendment is because I think that, I believe that those 45 words are the most important, uh, arguably the, the, the most important 45 words in the Constitution. They are what uh, allows, permits, makes possible our, our freedom. We have had an epidemic of fake news. Uh, we've had a lot of problems of, of this sort, which undermines uh, the, uh, the concepts of the First Amendment in many ways. Well, hopefully, uh, over long periods of time, uh, we will preserve the freedom that was part of the founding of this country and extend it not only in this country but throughout the world. Uh, it, this is just a small uh, token. I, I, I have no notion that, that, that this, uh, this symposium or the, uh, the sculpture uh, you know, is going to change the world, but I hope that it will contribute some understanding uh, well, on the part of the students, a part of faculty, and part of uh, people in the community uh, about uh, the First Amendment and about our freedoms. I hope that they are, are learning that you, you do not try to uh, hedge in uh, the freedoms, uh, that, that uh, you, you've got to have faith uh, that freedom will prevail uh, and uh, that uh, there should not be uh, an attempt to define uh, who can and cannot exercise the basic freedoms. I know I speak for all of us when I say that we very much miss the presence and contribution of Robert Balin. I'd now like to welcome Professor Eileen Prusher who will introduce our keynote speaker for the 8th Annual Robert Balin Symposium. Eileen Prusher is a senior instructor of multimedia journalism, the School of Communication and Multimedia Studies, and faculty advisor to the student media. She came to FAU in 2015 after nearly two decades abroad as a foreign correspondent, covering wars in Iraq and Afghanistan as well as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. She's a regular contributor to various national publications, and her most recent work has been published in the New York Times Book Review, NBC News Think, The Forward, and 538. Please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Eileen Prusher. Thank you so much, Dr. Wagner. Oh, it's so good to see people here today. Um, even though we're, you know, a little bit limited in numbers, it's just good to be in, in a room with uh, people interested in, and know the importance of these issues. Um, I'm here today to introduce Ested Herndon. So first I'll read a tiny bit from his uh, bio, and then I want to add a couple of personal words. Ested Herndon is a national politics reporter for the New York Times and a political analyst for CNN. He was an integral part of the Times political coverage in the 2018 midterm elections and the 2020 presidential election. Before joining the New York Times in 2018, Herndon held several positions at the Boston Globe, including as a national politics reporter in the Globe's Washington office covering the Trump White House. Ested Herndon is from the Chicago suburbs and graduated from Marquette University. In 2020, he was named to Forbes magazine's 30 under 30 media list, meaning the 30 most important journalists you should know about under the age of 30. All of which means he's might be a year or two younger than I am. <laughs> all right, well actually, beyond all of those um, you know, impressive things about Ested um, and, the, and the impressive resume and publications, I'd like to say something about how I know Ested and why I'm so excited about welcoming him here to FAU today. I met Ested Herndon about four years ago when I was a visiting faculty member for a program called FASB, which stands for the Fellowships at Auschwitz for the Study of Professional Ethics. 
Ested was one of around 30 fellows who came on a highly selective fellowship that includes a trip to Germany and Poland. The fellows are all young people who are either enrolled in the nation's top graduate schools or are at the very beginning of their professional lives in five key professions, medicine, law, business, clergy, and of course, journalism. We spent two intensive weeks of looking at these um, at the professions and these professions in particular and the role that they played, be it in resistance or in being complicit with the Nazi project during the Holocaust. We spent a great deal of time discussing the responsibility we in the journalism profession have in exposing uncomfortable truths and not normalizing what we know to be morally wrong. But we, the faculty and fellows, also spend time viewing this difficult history and then looking to the present and the future and asking ourselves, what are the greatest ethical challenges of our day? How will we behave with ethical dilemmas that come tomorrow? And how, in the positions of power in our professions that many of these fellows were about to step into, or were, in Estead's case, were already in because he was one of the few people who was not a graduate student but was already a young award-winning reporter at the Boston Globe, how are we going to be able to better navigate those dilemmas? I'm honored to have Sted with us today because I actually walked through the remnants of Auschwitz with him, and I know how much he cares about humanity, that he has a deep commitment to exposing injustice and asking the questions that need to be asked, that he has a rare ability to listen deeply and draw on varied viewpoints in his work. Today we celebrate the Constitution and the inalienable rights outlined in the Declaration of Independence, and today, when we speak about rights, we cannot but address the state of voting rights in America and in the state of Florida. With that, please welcome Ested Herndon. Thank you all so much. Um, I am going to close that because it gives me the willies. Um, I appreciate you coming out, and thank you, uh, Eileen, for that introduction. I am going to be honest and say I am so excited to see uh, this many people here. I am shocked that this many people <laughs> would be interested in what I have to say, particularly with the list of folks who I know have been here um, before. I'm really honored to come after journalists I admire, like April Ryan, pundits I've worked with, like Anna Navarro. And I sometimes think, uh, how did I get here? <laughs> um, I don't know if you know, but not that long ago, I was one of the college students who was probably sitting in one of these seats. Uh, to be honest with you, I was probably the college student who's at their dorm right now thinking, is that guy talking right now, but didn't put in their calendar? But, and so, but in my head, I would have been one of you all. And um, I want to today talk about voting rights and democracy and how my last three years as a member of the Times political team, as traveling the country uh, on, on both sides of the aisle, has informed um, that view. But first, I want to say thank you. I'm very thankful for everyone who made this great event possible, and I'm honored to be here. I particularly want to thank Florida Atlantic University and the staff and professors who have made this possible, including those who support the university's critical work in political and media education. Let's give them a hand. I also want to thank Eileen, uh, the professor here who um, I met several years ago, as she mentioned, and really helped make this possible. It is no small task getting me uh, anywhere, considering the amount of travel and my just general refusal to answer any mails on time. So thank you, Eileen, and thank you to FAU. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there is an understandable urgency about voting rights and democracy. And I am a politics reporter not a voting rights reporter. And for a long time, the political sphere thought of two, those two things as distinct. The idea was that gerrymandering or, or, or things that affected voting rights were all part of the game. The thinking went that politics itself was a game and that both sides engaged in these distortions for their political advantage, that it was just the rules of the road. If you can remember way back to the Obama administration, <laughs> when the Supreme Court effectively struck down the Voting Rights Act of 1965 in the Shelby County decision, the immediate response from Washington Democrats was criticism, yes, but it wasn't outright panic. There was still the belief in the party, as there is now, that you could out-organize voter suppression, 
and that if a campaign tried hard enough, that those rules will become irrelevant. There is still a belief in political journalism that voter suppression is an issue of the past, that it is the story of water hoses and Bull Connor, that it's poll taxes and the civil rights movement, and that American democracy has been tested but not broken because our shared belief in the principles of democracy are altogether too strong. It's lasted for too long. Well, we in journalism love an explicit nut graph, so let me give you one. If there's anything I have learned from seeing the last election up close, about traveling the country in the middle of a pandemic that has reshaped society and democracy, if there's anything I've learned from the dozens of Trump rallies I have attended, the politicians I have interviewed, the voters I have shared beers with, and the political sultans I have annoyed, it's that you should rid yourself of that notion. American democracy is fragile and new, and it has never, until maybe the last 40 or 50 years, made a real serious attempt at being applied to all of its citizens. The ground that we stand on is shaky. With that context, I think it's easier to get a sense of our theme today, the right to vote in the Constitution. The current threats to democracy are not, in my opinion, the work of a single aberrant individual, say a former reality show host who became the President of the United States. But it's about the system that has always believed in the words of multiracial democracy more than it's believed in its reality. This is, in my opinion, the real big lie of voting rights. It's that racism and multiracial democracy are incompatible, but they are both written into our Constitution. But if we want to protect one, we have to rid ourselves of the other. I would like to take you through several work examples of this tension that mostly come from my reporting, but also the work of others. But before I start, I want to proactively answer a question that I often get on this topic, which is actually about hope. I'm a journalist, but my father is a Christian pastor in Chicago, and I actually find that our jobs can be very similar, except for a couple important differences. One, I'm not going to be up here for an hour. <laughs> uh, two, uh, while we both believe in bearing witness and speaking truth to power, and the principles of social justice and equality that have long been associated with the black church, his story always ends in redemption. There is always someone looking out for you that makes sure things won't be too bad. There's always light at the end of the tunnel. I am a reporter. I offer no such comfort. If your question is where do we go from here, my answer is I don't know. If you think the January 6th insurrection closed the chapter on the Trump era, that closed the book that will never be opened again, I would say that's short-sighted. And if you think that tone is bleak or unflinching, I would agree with you, but I also think it's true. There is no affirmative right to vote in the United States Constitution. Voting discrimination was made illegal by the 15th Amendment, uh, particularly on race, and gender discrimination in voting is made illegal by the 19th Amendment. And there are certainly laws passed to target uh, voter suppression and discrimination like the Voting Rights Act, there's not, a, there's not yet a place in the United States Constitution that affirmatively says that every American has the right to vote. Why do we think that is? Did they forget? Had they not considered it? Did uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda not write that as part, of the, as part of the play? No, it's not there because it is not what they believed. It's not complicated or hyperbole. That is the truth about our Constitution. They cannot federally define voting rights because they cannot define who was Americans, enslaved black Americans, Native Americans ousted from their homeland. Women, and especially women of color, were yet to be brought into our democracy experiment. They were subjects still. They were not citizens. And the story of how that changed is familiar to us, but let us not be euphemistic. I know it's poor form to insult a quote from Martin Luther King, <laughs> but I have always disdained the way that politicians have distorted his famous saying that the arc of morality bends towards justice. They're missing the broader context of the speech. Progress is not inevitable or assured, and there is no guarantee of success. There was struggle, and there was blood. Martin Luther King's, junior rating, Mar Martin Luther King's approval rating at the time of his death was dismal. The majority of white Americans felt he hurt the cause and caused controversy. Sometimes, because I'm a guy who loves fun, I read the CIA's letter that they sent to him to encourage him to kill himself. Because I know that that tells the truth 
about how our democracy has always been. It has not always bent towards justice, but has required people forcing it to move in that direction. This is how I view democracy. From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement, which has often been seen, this has often been seen as distinct American conflicts that I also view can be distilled into a single one. It is the struggle to answer the question that the founders avoided answering themselves. The census can tell us who resides in America, but the Constitution and voting rights tell us who are the Americans that we are prioritizing. So that absence of an affirmative right to vote enshrined in the Constitution can be seen as maybe an original sin of voting rights. But journalists and, uh, and journalists and politicians work from our agreed norm that every American enjoys a right to vote, even though that has not often been the political or legal reality. The onus has been placed on historically marginalized communities to prove that their right was being taken away. Of course, we currently have a system that has been far from the universal expansion of voting rights access. For every Virginia, Illinois, or Louisiana, states that have expanded voting access since the 2020 election, there are also Georgia's, Iowa's, Texas's, and yes, Florida's, states that have passed voting rights, um, voting rights laws in line with President Donald Trump's claims of a rigged election. Now, it's important to note that these laws are different state by state. And some, like Florida, might be more about political show or a certain governor's political ambitions than about substantive changes to the law. But others, like Georgia or Texas, have ignited concerns that the former president's efforts to overturn the election were more of a practice run than the main event. And these alarmists argue that what has transpired since the 2020 election constitutes more than just the grievances of a single person and a single group of followers, but has become a default position of the major American party, and it threatens our um, democratic systems. My reporting, my experiences, tell me these alarmists are correct. I was in Iowa last month when a crowd of hundreds cheered Marjorie Taylor Greene, who declared Donald Trump the rightful winner of the 2020 election. I was in Michigan early this year when the state party censured two Republican members of Congress for telling the truth about what happened in January 6th. That same week, I met with county Republicans who had been ousted from their positions because they refused to ignore the reality that far-right rioters, encouraged by the president, stormed the seat of democracy to violently overthrow an election. Acknowledging that reality, a fact, cost them their party posts, as hardliners are taking over the levels of the Michigan Republican Party. This is happening all over the country, in red states and blue states, in places where Republicans have a great shot, like Texas, an okay shot, like Michigan, or even a bad shot, like New York. And it's happening among the grassroots, which means that our friends in Washington might be a little slow to recognize it, as Congress is often a lagging indicator of how the parties have changed and reflecting of their basis. On January 17th, just 11 days after the Capitol insurrection, I wrote a story in the Times that was titled, How Republicans Are Warping Reality on the Capitol Attacks. It doesn't seem controversial now, but at that time, it was a real struggle to make that story happen. Because the consensus, particularly in Washington, was that a red line had finally been crossed. The actions of January 6th would be enough for Republicans to break from Trump, and that as Biden came in, this was the end. Of course, has not been. Republicans who broke away from the party in that moment are more ostracized than ever. Donald Trump remains the party's most popular figure and the odds on favorite to be the Republican nominee in 2024. But how was that clear on January 17th and not clear in Washington until months later? The answer is where I got the story from. Not party leaders or Washington consultants, even elected officials themselves. I was, in my I was sitting in my bed, in home, and on Facebook. <laughs> I, since 2017, wanted to be fully immersed in the media and messaging that the base level of Trump supporters see. I joined dozens and dozens of Trump supporting accounts, conservative media stations, far-right talking heads, and right-wing uh, podcasts, and I prioritized them all on social media to make sure they were the only thing I saw for about four years. I know what you're thinking. How could you ruin Facebook like this? How would I miss my cousin's birthday? But it actually helped me see the political messaging that, as Trump supporters did, unfiltered, unvarnished, all-encompassing. 
And this is, in my opinion, another misunderstanding around voting rights. And it compounds with misunderstanding our origins. That is not to absolve elected officials who have used their platforms to spread misinformation and lies. But you should think of these elected officials as reactors who are reflecting a larger sentiment rather than driving it. Let me give you some examples from my own reporting. First, I would like you to think of what political issue you most associate with Donald Trump's rise to the White House. Is it the southern border wall? The travel ban on Muslim countries? Maybe tax cuts? Or the repeal of Obamacare? Well, I've been to a dozen Trump rallies. I've taught, went to Trump's stock, the Woodstock in northern Arizona. I've had breakfast with Trump supporters in Minnesota. Had a pizza with guys who told me he was going to start a civil war if Trump did not win re-election. And on the day that Biden was announced as a winner, I was in church at a Trump-supporting church that prayed that Black Lives Matter's protesters would be shot if they came to their town. And I would say, what these people have taught me is that Donald Trump did not come out of nowhere to win the 2016 Republican primary. He was the most famous face who had been speaking on the issue that was most popular in the Republican voter base, that Barack Obama was not born in America and was an illegitimate president. That is not anecdotal. I looked this up last night. In August 2016, NBC, poll found, NBC and Survey Monkey polling found that 72% of Republican voters still doubted President Obama's citizenship. That's a popular issue. 72%. Birtherism was not fringe. It was only fringe in the blind spots of mainstream media in Washington. And that blind spot stopped us from fully initially recognizing the, Trump, the front runner that Trump always was. There are examples that are also recent about the base pushing the electeds rather than the opposite way around. In Alabama last month, a kind of rare thing happened. Trump was booed by his own supporters at a rally. It was because he was talking about taking the coronavirus vaccine, which was a rare point of daylight between Trump the person and the movement. But it wasn't the base that changed their tune after that rally. It wasn't Trump media. It was the former president. And as recently as last week, he has come to say that he would not get a booster shot if that, would become, if, that, if that becomes available. Here's another one. In the immediate wake of the Afghanistan withdrawal, what did Donald Trump's initial statement say? It actually hit Biden for not taking in more Afghanistan refugees. That's right, more. The exact statement was that Afghans who assisted the U.S. to, quote, be allowed to seek refuge. But this stance lasted 24 hours, as it was the movement that dictated the change. Two days later, he released a statement saying refugee resettlement did not put, quote, America first. These are the examples of why I reject the notion that the current state of America's fragile democracy can be chalked up to a single individual. It is an American problem, born from our founders, endemic in our citizenry, and furthered by our unwillingness to confront it. There are, however, some public servants who have, used, uh, who have used their platforms. There are some public servants who bear more responsibility and several systemic problems that have accelerated the issue. Partisan gerrymandering has completely insulated most House members from competitive elections. The Senate is not only more proportionally skewed than ever in relation to the American population, but it's held on to a filibuster that, is, that threatens to sink any federal major legislation. The Electoral College is, well, I actually don't think I need to tell Florida about the Electoral College. <laughs> it's important to remember that the ta there are tangible effects to the way these structures distort our political system. I'll tell another example using sports. I remember last year's NBA playoffs when the Milwaukee Bucks refused to play after a police shooting in nearby Kenosha, Wisconsin. It was a powerful moment of activism where it was open question about whether this would matter in a swing state. They listed policy demands, hoping for the legislature and the governor to act. As they were talking, I thought, how sad. Not just because I hate the Bucks, but because Washington, I mean, Wisconsin state legislature one of the most gerrymandered in the country, even in the purple state, 
is completely insulated, Republican state legislatures, from caring about Milwaukee or the demands for its most famous citizens. Public support itself is largely irrelevant as, elected, as electeds have insulated themselves from concerns. This is not how I was told democracy was supposed to work. But this is how members of both parties have let it develop. Even Democrats, who have now made voting rights a rallying cry as well as, uh, as, well as democracy protection, are frankly unfashionably late to a party they have long ignored. In the Obama era, drunk on the promise of demographic destiny, the idea of a, mu a rising multiracial coalition would inevitably lift Democrats to sustain political power was widespread. But they forgot that distinction I made earlier. The census can tell you who is here, but voting rights tells you who will matter. And the rules of the game can be changed. In the past year, two stories remind me how the Democratic Party's words on the urgency of voting rights have rarely matched its actions. The first was in Georgia, where I talked to, yes, Stacey Abrams, but also the black women who came before her, who organized to increase minority voter participation and democratic investment in southern states. Today, they are widely recognized for helping Joe Biden win the White House after Georgia flipped. There's Abrams candles and t-shirts, iconography that, it's, that stretches in Georgia and beyond. But they talk about the years before that, when they were repeatedly rejected by liberal and progressive organizations who did not think that voting rights was an issue worth funding. It wasn't Vogue. They were the wrong gender. They were the wrong race. They were advocating the wrong issue. And they lived in the wrong part of America. One woman that story put it succinctly, quote, we are women, we are Southern women, and we're not just Southern women, we're Southern black women. Another called out the DNC by name, saying they would prefer to have their favorite pastor or favorite community activist just run programs. For years, it was just no accountability, no data. For another story this year, I went to Jackson, Mississippi, a place where the struggle of voting rights and multiracial democracy is literally in the ground. I met Frank Figures and local activists who talked about the city's pain when Medgar Evers was murdered. Black civil rights groups consistently call voting rights their top issue. I went there, though, because the congressman from that district, Benny Thompson, was the only Democrat to vote against H.R. 1. And I wondered why. That is the voting rights legislation that would, among other things, seek to federalize election law and combat gerrymandering. It has been universally praised by Democrats as their top priority in combating voter suppression. So, but when I asked around to anyone who would listen about why a black Democratic congressman from Jackson will vote against the Democrats' top priority in voting rights, the answer might surprise you. Congressman Thompson, like several other members, particularly in the Congressional Black Caucus, are nervous about the sweeping changes of H.R. 1. And I learned the reason. In the South, those gerrymandered maps pack black residents often into their districts. And so, even as gerrymandering has changed the makeup of the state overall, it has created safe, winnable districts with the majority of black voters. If you're a glass half full type, you can say that Thompson and others who share that thinking want, want to protect those districts, want to protect that makeup and ensure there is black representation still through the South. There's also those who choose cynicism. It's a politician more concerned about the re-election chances than lowercase d democratic equity. Both Alabama and Mississippi speak to the difference between protection of Democrats and the protection of democracy, which are ideas that are sometimes in conflict. Democratic Party leaders say today they no longer have this problem, pointing to their near universal support of the H.R. 1 bill, but also of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, which would restore uh, what the Supreme Court took down. But we also have to question this commitment. Does it extend to the Senate? Does it extend to caring about the filibuster? And will Democrats prioritize voting rights over what is already a packed agenda? That does not mean Washington will this month vote on H.R. 1 and the John Lewis Voting Rights Bill. And these bills are likely to fail absent changes to the Senate filibuster. But even if they pass, 
One person reminded me that Democrats are seeking a 2008 solution to a 2021 problem. Voter suppression is one thing. Voter subversion is another. And that is what we saw after November. The willingness to throw out fair results and decertify will not be addressed by either of these bills. That does not mean they are not important. When I was in Mississippi, I interviewed Eric Holder, the former attorney general under President Obama who has since focused on protecting voting rights and democracy. He said very flatly, quote, we will still have elections every two to four years, but they could be rendered close to meaningless. He also said of his fellow Democrats, we think of ourselves as a national federal party without understanding the connection between the makeup of state legislatures and governors at the same level. But when I told this to one of those activists in Jackson, they let out a chuckle. They said, it's you and Washington who did not see those things. But quote, we were never able to not see them here. To borrow a phrase from Joe Biden, I do believe America is in the battle of a soul of the, uh, in a battle for the soul of the nation. What does that mean? Was the battle about was the battle about removing Trump, or is that battle over now that Trump is here, with the rest of us in Florida? I do not know what President Biden believes, but I do think the Republican Party has a clear and unified sense of purpose in this moment. Critical race theory, wokeness cancel culture, the targeting election processes in non-white communities, or even the QAnon conspiracy theories, they all have a singular shared through line, curtailing the political and social power among democratic coalitions that many find illegitimate. And aided by gerrymandering in state legislatures in the House, Senate population distribution, and the electoral college that makes popular votes relevant, it is a path to power that can provide a route through base motivation rather than persuasion. Certainly the strategy has risks, as Trump found out in Georgia, Arizona, Nevada, and across the Midwest this November. However, it also has its rewards. There is no need, for example, to convince the median Republican voter that America is in an existential crisis. They already believe it and have for a long time. This was true before the 2020 election. In 2018, ahead of the midterms, I went to Ohio to watch a conservative film by Dinesh D'Souza that compared Democrats to Adolf Hitler and Donald Trump to Abraham Lincoln. I went because the Republican Party in the county was showing it as a fundraiser. But one man told me something then that sounds very similar to what I heard repeatedly after the 2020 election. Quote, a group of individuals in our government have been rigging elections. They stole 2012, they tried to steal 2016, and we're gonna get ahead of these things and fight them before it's too late, and it's almost too late. This, in my opinion, encapsulates the state of urgency around voting rights and democracy in America. Polling tells us that among the Republican voter base, the belief that Joe Biden is an illegitimate president is widespread as is the idea that Donald Trump may soon be installed as a replacement. My reporting tells me the issue is beyond that. It is not only a feeling about the election itself, but a claim that, those, that, a claim that the communities that elected Joe Biden do not have equal stake in American political power, that they themselves are the fraud. This is what January 6th was about. And I say this as someone who interviewed and knew people who went to the Capitol. I believe the rioters when they were shocked to be arrested, even as they live streamed their crimes to the rest of the country. That is because in their mind, that building is their own. American democracy is their own. And Donald Trump has protected, was a president who protected that sense of ownership against those who would take it from them. But here's the final thing I want to say is how wrong is that belief really? Did the Founding Fathers want democracy apply to all? No. For years, did the Capitol building honor the same man who went to war, uh, honor the same man who went to war against the United States to keep black Americans enslaved? Yes. 
Do we have a political system that often prioritizes certain types of Americans through partisan and racial gerrymandering, through the Electoral College and Senate population distribution? Absolutely. So if you view yourself as opposed to those insurrectionists, if you view them as your enemy in the battle for the soul of this nation, if we want to use this Constitution Day to reignite our commitment to equitable voting rights and to democracy, let us be clear what we, are, what we are up against. It is the side of the folks at the Capitol that is seeking to return the country to its natural state of racial and societal hierarchies, to what our founders intended, and to what our structures often encourage us to remain. What the opposite side is thinking, the side who believes in multiracial democracy is thinking, is us trying to create an America that had to this point is new. And that, in the end, may be a harder task. Thank you all for listening to me, and thank you for your time. This is the time of our program. We're going to move to our panel. And uh, I want to introduce you to our distinguished panel. Um, on my, all of them sitting on my left, uh, Daniel Rivero is a reporter and producer at WLRN News, South Florida's NPR affiliate and critical part of their team's coverage of the recently earned WLRN this year's National Edward R. Morrow Award for Overall Excellence. In addition to his in-depth coverage of voting rights in Florida, he covers Latino and criminal justice issues. Jillian Manning is the editor-in-chief of the University Press, the FAU student newspaper. Jillian is also a regular contributor to SFGN, South Florida Gay News, and will be graduating this fall with a degree in multimedia journalism. And Kennedy McKenna is the president of the Black Student Union and founder of the Paradigm Press, FAU's first, FAU's first black newspaper. She's a junior majoring in multimedia journalism with a minor in business law. The panel will be moderated by uh, our own Professor Prusher. Wow. Well, first of all, I want to just say a word of, uh, of, of wow and appreciation to Ested for giving us so much great food for thought um, and, and actually doing what I think we are tasked with doing in journalism, which is, um, you know, of my favorite quotes, like, let's not be euphemistic. Like, let, let's call it what it is. Let's really talk about it. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, hearing words that, like, both I want to cheer and cry at the same time, which is, progress is not inevitable, right? We're kind of assuming that. I think as Americans, like we, I've spent a lot of time in different parts of the world and people see us as very idealistic and I think there's truth in that. And there's, um, there's yeah, you really should have that one. Maybe I should, I can, I don't know, you want me to pass that? Sorry, mic mix up. Um, that there's something that's incredibly, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, people will say to me, oh, you Americans are so optimistic. Um, but, you know, op the optimism could be blinding at times to what is actually in, in front of us. Um, I have questions that I want to ask the panel, but I think what I want to do is, um, is to first let um, each panelist um, offer, you know, one, um, you know, thought that's uh, potentially, let's say, a, a comment on, follow-up, or reaction to what Ested spoke about. And you know, if it if it comes up that it's relevant to things that you've been covering, um, that's great too. So I'd like to start first um, with Daniel Rivero from WLRN, our NPR affiliate, um, Yay Public Radio, um, and I'm so glad that you were able to come up from Miami today to be with us. So let's start with you, Daniel, and and you know, picking one part from that talk, which is not going to be easy, but that really um, that you think resonates, and in particular, of course, you're covering these voting rights issues all the time closer to home in the Florida context. So I'd love to um, give you the proverbial mic first. Right, thanks. Okay, you can hear me. Um, thanks for having me on. Um, I mean, one thing that I was thinking about repeatedly when Ested was, was talking was, I think he is absolutely right that there is a broad consensus with Republicans across the country with a lot of issues with respect to the voting rights. I, I think about these things 
in a state and a local context usually because that's t typically the kind of coverage that I do, the people I talk to all the time. And what's interesting is that on this one level below the national level, there is a lot of conflict within Republicans even as they are aligned in this one issue. And so I think there was a, there was a, a law that was passed just a couple months ago that, that rolled back some aspects of voting rights, made voting by mail harder, et cetera, in Florida. Even after we had an amazing election, there was no complaints. We had our election overhaul in 2018 after the nightmare recount. We got it right. I talked to people in the legislature, leaders, Republican leaders, they told me we got it right, and then they went and did it anyways. So every county in Florida, constitutionally, the state constitution I'm talking about, has its own elected voting officials and election officials. Across the board, 100% of them were against the law that was passed by the legislature, including all the Republicans, all of them. They testified in Tallahassee saying, this is bad news. This is going to hurt us. This is going to hurt the elderly voters that vote by mail in, in the villages. This is going to hurt, you know, I, I remember seeing uh, one of them saying, this is going to hurt my mom. This is how she votes by mail because you, you're not going to be able to hand your ballot to someone else to go bring it and, and turn it in. And so there are very interesting dynamics at the state level with state level authoritarianistic policies. Um, that are coming down, not just in Florida, but in other parts of the country, but we're seeing a lot of that in Florida. And um, that's where we're starting to see a little bit of grassroots, really ground level pushback, which could m metastasize into a larger pushback and maybe something else. I mean, we're seeing that now with all these mask mandate bans that are, that are happening. Um, this is top down. Governor DeSantis here in Florida said we're gonna we're not gonna let anyone do mask mandates in their schools. Well, now we have all these counties, including a handful of Republican counties, that are pushing back and saying, no, 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 you can't do that. You don't have the authority to do that. And then we're at the point now where I don't know if this is gonna be something really big or if it's gonna be a flash in the pan, but it's definitely something really interesting to keep our eyes on. And, and, you know, instead, if there's some point that you want to, you know, jump back in, you can, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll keep this conversation going. But if there's something that you feel like you want to clarify, you can, you can bounce back in. And I, I give you permission to do that without raising your hand, unlike my students. Um, but, um, you know, you, you were referring, instead to, you know, the, the kind of attempt to federalize election law. And it's kind of showing that, you know, that's, not only is that, you know, looking unlikely of passing, but then, you know, every county deciding for itself. I mean, this is not the way the elections are run in most parts of the world, just, just FYI, right. but uh, as probably a lot of you know. Um, but thank you for that. Let's, let's um, just, we'll kind of go down the road. We'll go to Jillian and then Kennedy. Sure. Um, can, is my mic on? Can, can you hear her? No, I don't think so. Oh, now? There it is. I um, think you, yeah, I hear you now. <laughs> um, I said you made a lot of really brilliant points and I think um, you know you talked about how we report the truth and sometimes the truth is bleak um, and I know that students such as my students such as myself can sometimes maybe should I take this off um, can sometimes feel overwhelmed by that do you have any suggestions for students who are kind of paying attention to these issues about what they can do uh, moving forward and looking ahead yeah um, you know, I think as reporters, I think that, that one's on. is this one on? Yeah. Hello. Your room okay? I can also just, I'm just like laugh. Well, there's some people who are seeing it on live stream, so maybe one one of them should be on. Hello, hello. Okay, you yeah, you're good. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's still things that matter, right? And so I think that like you, you, you know, if you are a reporter. You go to those things not only in you know I mean I, I don't go to things necessarily in like change making view but in bearing witness view and 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 not and not running from it and I think that still has real value and so I think that as from a journalist sense like that's what I would say is that there is still um, uh, an importance to the role but obviously like like you know I think that there are macro things that are are big structures that are worth thinking about directly but I don't think that like you know. Uh, that makes every individual action useless. So, you know, the same things that I think that people think about in terms of trying to make change and, you know, marketing or whatever, whatever, like, I'm not a hater. I just think from a reporter point of view, 
I find the power in bearing witness and being and 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 kind of um, first draft of history esque and, and not being clear about that. And I think less about um, saving us. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Okay, so for me, my biggest takeaway was when you said that we can't just blame one person or one figurehead for the state of our democracy. And I feel like with Paradigm, we try to make sure that we're fair and not just blaming one person and you know getting the full story and being very objective in our reporting. That was, was my biggest takeaway from what you said. Thanks, okay, great. So uh, I wanted to um, mention something that I found uh, online, Ested. Um, you were featured in a Behind the Byline interview in the New York Times that was fun to read. Uh, that I found yesterday, and you were asked this question, it was just a few months ago, I think it was published, what kind of stories you're drawn to? And you answered, I find myself drawn to stories that seek to expose things that the political consensus may have missed. In political reporting, I believe there can be a sense of conventional wisdom that is taken as fact about certain communities and their priorities. I believe this hive mind was exposed in the 2016 election where it became clear that the media did not have the correct pulse on the respective bases of the Democratic and Republican parties. And I want to be part of that solution, making sure we better prepare the public to understand elections in the future. So my question to each of you is, is focused on that, is how can we better prepare the public to say we can't just be paying attention you know, in 2020 and then again in 2024 when you know, September rolls around and you know, there's a decision to be made in two months. Um, do you think that we in the media are doing enough in terms of uh, covering this assault on, on voting rights, which you outlined in your speech? Um, how should we be covering it? How can we do it better? And then uh, when we get to you students, I'd like to hear from you, how can you make your readers or viewers or listeners care about this issue? Um, I, I feel like there's, there's a lot of, you know, well, now that we're not in an election cycle, I can just ignore it. Um, but we see that there's a lot happening legislatively when we're not sort of getting our time to vote card in the mail. Um, so maybe we, I'll, I'll throw that out to Ested first and then we can kind of head on down the line. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I, I, think that, um, I, I mentioned that Eric Holder interview in there. And the one thing he said in there was that he thought Democrats were asleep at the will in 2009, right? This is the Joe Biden version of 2009. Like this is the moment to not be asleep. <laughs> and so, um, if if you are a Democrat who is looking ahead, uh, uh, you know midterms are going to be hard, <laughs> and there is a real uh, chance that the window of the kind of trifecta that they have is a short one. And so, I think that um, as of what we can prepare folks to do on that front is is, is I think true um, on the state and local level. I think it's true kind of free from Washington. I mean, it, it's like going to Michigan to do that thing of what I was talking about. Part of that is to say, hey, even if it is not, even, even if the kind of Washington story has moved on, right, the, the, the factors that created um, our, our kind of democracy stress test are still playing out. And I think that we should continue to do stories, particularly on the state and local level that show that. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. I mean, I think um, it's like last week I talked to to a former mayor for a story I have coming out, and he's you know he's been in politics for a long time, close friend of the Clintons, close friends of 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 Joe Biden, and he told me his read on the political situation right now. He said the Democrats are not doing anything that they need to be doing. They are going to get slaughtered in the midterm elections. And he was, he was pointing to historical parallels to me. He said, this is feeling like the, the Jimmy Carter presidency, which I was not alive for, but I've read about it. And it was not pretty, right? It was high inflation. Um, there was trouble overseas. And, and he was just kind of going down the list of like, this is seemingly what is going on. And while all this is happening, the, the, the Reagan counter revolution is organizing. They are picking up steam. They didn't pack up their bags. They didn't take the year off and think about what are we gonna gonna do they're in the streets now i run i run into them you know um i i, I was at a, a rally a couple of weeks ago the proud boys are out there they assaulted me i had to fire a police file a police report it's like these things are happening in the streets and uh, to some degree it's just keeping your eyes open to it and it's not and uh, the 2009 thing i think was there was such a, re a for democrats an air of relief that they did this, that they got their guy in there, that they thought it was just gonna like 
it was just going to play out in their favor because they have this, like Ested said, they're drunk on the demographic destiny, which is like just BS. I mean, like in Florida, we should know that by now too. Like out of all places, like that, it just does not apply. And, um, you know, I, I, I do some reporting on the, the state Democratic Party and they are a total mess. Like they don't know what they're doing. They just literally don't. And most people behind the scenes will tell you, we don't know what we're doing. And, um, you know, the, the party was already pretty weak here. In this political moment, it seems like with the, the midterm election, the governor will be up for election. He might be vulnerable now, but there's not the organizing that they need to do. And the Republicans are still on, on, on the ascent. So, I mean, I, we, we tell the, the tick, tick kind of everyday stories. And then what we also do, and I think it's our job to do, is tell the bigger stories. Like, okay, we, we, we drew a bunch of dots on the board across the calendar. Let me connect them all for you. And then let me go back. You know, I spend time in the library. I love spending time in the library. It's actually necessary for this job because then you can have historical things to hang it on, like the Jimmy Carter thing. What we're happening now, how does it compare to what happened then? And when you can draw those two things together, you can help people understand what's happening better. And I think as a profession, we need to be better at history because if you're a good journalist, you're also a historian. And I don't think we say that explicitly enough sometimes. Julian and then Kennedy. Um, when it comes to getting people interested, um, speaking from what I've observed in my generation, I think there can be a feeling of, um, like I said, not knowing what to do or how to get involved or feeling perhaps like things like politics and government don't impact people directly, um, don't impact you and yourself directly. Uh, so one of my goals has been trying to demonstrate to students how these policies do impact them and do really you know, make a difference in their life, whether or not they realize it. Um, for example, COVID policy and student government, you know, however you feel about it, it's really important. You know, we've been trying to cover it and let students know that it is something that impacts their day-to-day -day life, you know, whether or not you agree with um, COVID policies, right? It impacts how you spend your time on campus, it impacts you know, how you go about your day, it impacts um, your anxiety or lack thereof. Um, so really just trying to, on the hyperlocal university level, show how policies in student government and administration impact the lives of students every day. Yeah, I would agree. Um, what we've been trying to do is localize all of our political stories and then also trying out different mediums like social media and email lists and text blasts to try to reach them in a different way. But we do, you know, unfortunately realize that the political stories do get less reads when it's not um, an election year. So, you know, to follow up, um, I'm going to throw out another question and maybe just to mix it up a little, we'll, we'll reverse. I'll start this one this, uh, at Kennedy this time. Um, so um, a year ago plus, um, we had just seen or some of us participated in or some of us covered a massive social upheaval uh, following the murder of George Floyd and the wave of protests uh, that you know really spread around the world against systemic racism and police brutality, uh, among other injustices. Um, but we don't see those protesters out there now uh, necessarily, although sometimes there are pockets of that. And I'm wondering what impact do you think that period has had on uh, the moment we find ourselves in now, which is maybe the the, the battle now is focused on uh, voting rights and representation, and and do. Do our readers and viewers start pay paying attention if there aren't, you know, thousands of protesters in the streets? Mm -hmm. So let me start with you with that, Kennedy. Yes, I will definitely say, like, we, um, I know that for FAU, we just passed the one-year anniversary of our protest that we had last year. And um, there is there are less people who are involved because it isn't as much in your face. So I feel like, you know, our job is to go out and seek, you know, these grassroots organizations who are still doing things to show that they're... Um, that people are still protesting and advocating for these um, different causes. Yeah, exactly what Kennedy said. Um, she made a really great point that just trying to keep it at the forefront of people's minds because students haven't forgotten. If you ask students, you know, what they think about these issues, they remember very deeply and they still feel it very deeply. Um, when there is something big that happens in the news, they remember it and they're still impacted by it. Um, so again, I think there's also the potential of, you know, we had these protests, but what came of it? 
uh, so trying to keep this on the forefront of people's minds, making sure that they don't forget um, so that potentially there's still progress and of course coverage. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the events of last summer were definitely a major moment in American history and I think the election itself kind of overshadowed that, but the long tail of it is still, is still ongoing. Um, you know, we have local races where they still use imagery that was taken in some of those, um, those protests that turned violent in some parts of the country and they use that as like, you know, painting their opponent as this is what they support. And that part has not completely gone away because it was such a pivotal moment in American history, definitely, you know, modern, current American history. Um, so it hasn't gone away in terms of, of a talking point and saying like, this is what these people want. They want chaos, anarchy, et cetera. I mean, we had a, a law passed here in, in Florida, which is being litigated. It was just tossed out by a federal judge. Of course, it'll be, um, you know, appealed and whatnot. And that was this anti, so-called anti-riot law. Um, it's still being talked about, you know, we, we have not gotten away with it and we haven't really discussed the, the core issues underlying what the protest was about. It went straight to the, to the you know, the, 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 the symptoms and it, we didn't ever address the cause of the, of the illness. Um, and uh, until we do, I mean, it's, it's going to be ongoing. It's a pick, but I think are the tangible effects of last summer, I would say. Um, there has been like, I think, uh, uh, institutional and kind of like mainstream shift to largely acknowledge the realities of police injustice. I don't think that means that folks agree on solutions. They do not. Uh, but folks, there is a larger agreement, um, uh, I think both polling wise and political wise, that the status quo has some problems. Uh, and there's also been a lot of money that will have an importance of the way these grassroots organizations have been funded in a long-term way that I think is going to have a real political effect. But the effect has also been backlash, too, and that's also a real one um, that I think we need to acknowledge. Uh, from a media perspective, I think that, like, we cannot be reactive only to protest moments, you know? The issue itself is, remains. Right. And the thing, you know, the, the, the kind of media lesson I take from um, the George Floyd is like, you know, read that first PR, uh, read that first press release from the police department, read those first news stories that came out from organizations who took it as gospel. Like that is the lesson I think that we should take is that we cannot do that, you know, and we shouldn't have been doing it before last year, but we certainly shouldn't be doing it since last year. And I hope um, that's a long, uh, a long standing effect. I went to George Floyd's, I wrote our story for the George Floyd's Memorial in Houston, and um, it was a really wild day. But um, one thing I remember was that there was such a political focus on defunding, not defunding, whatever, whatever, all that stuff. But that really wasn't the emotions there, you know? There was more than any, um, more, I think more than any disagreement about what should happen, there was agreement that something needed to happen. And I think that we cannot lose sight of that. Go ahead. Yeah, following up on, on what Estad said, I think for us as a profession, um, you know, there's different kinds of journalism and it depends what kind of outlet you work for, who your audience is, how quick your turnaround is, if you have a week to do a story, if you have to get it out in an hour or two. And, and the, what this incident really exposed, what, what Ested was just talking about, was there's a lot of what I would call access journalism, where a lot of local TV stations, it's not the reporter's fault, it's kind of the nature of the work. They rely on having good relationships with police departments. And part of that is accepting anything they tell you and just, you know, just just spitting it right back out, kind of um, just regurgitating whatever they tell you, and you're not, you don't have the ability to be too critical about it. I don't think I've ever necessarily been like that myself. I've always been pretty questioning, but a lot of people are, and that's how, what a lot of the, the, the public absorbs is just basically a press release and a different letterhead. And um, we know now that it was, terrible. It was nowhere near the truth. And I think it's caused a lot of people and a lot of people in my profession to question it and to push back 
which we should be always doing that, but it's hard to do when you have you know, a one hour deadline. Yeah. But it really, it really brought it to the forefront that this is what you should be doing. Yeah, we were talking about, I was talking about my uh, crime reporting earlier today, and I know those pressures are really real. It's very hard to do that in the moment. Um, but in the same way that uh, individuals and communities are un unreliable narrators, police mm -hmm. are unreliable narrators also. So take, I think that taking their word is just as untrusted. So this is a perfect segue into a question I have about this delicate balance that we sometimes have to strike as people in the media with being journalists and being advocates, but we're trying to be advocates, I hope, for an issue to kind of shed light on the issue. So my question for you is, all of you, is it still our job to be balanced and is that the same thing as objectivity? Um, you know, what about when you see something that you think should be treated as a civil right or a fundamental human right, um, such as voting, and, and not as a partisan issue, but you will come across sources or readers or listeners who once they read or hear your report will say, oh, that reporter has some kind of an agenda. Um, is, it accept is it acceptable to have an agenda, especially if the agenda is something um, that you would think is universal, like voting rights? <laughs> uh, I, I mean, this is, this is the open combo of media right now, right? Like we, we um, I can, my personal opinion is I do not spend a lot of time caring about being at the well, celebrated midpoint of both parties. I care about being truthful. I care about being fair. I care about uh, context, history, you know, all of those things, absolutely. But I don't, I don't think it is, um, I don't think that objectivity, I think objectivity in the ways that it has often been um, relayed in journalism was really just a performative nonpartisanship. And um, I don't, and I think that goals like um, accuracy, fairness, uh, ba balance, if, you know, I mean, like, right, think about the ways we've changed about writing about climate change, right? No one quotes climate deniers anymore. No, you know, I mean, yeah, no one, I mean, hopefully not. Um, and that's been this change, right? There was, a, there was once balance in climate reporting, but that's not our role here. Right? Like, and so I think that there is an increasing level of comfort with um, owning those ideas that we care um, about facts first. And um, in my opinion, that is nonpartisan because both parties lie. So I don't find it to be any some uncomfortable position. If you are following those things, you'll catch them both. Can you hear me? Is it on? Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry, I, I couldn't hear it. Um, so I was at an NPR station briefly during the Obama years, and on, on that point, I remember it was official NPR policy that they were not going to cover the birther theory. They weren't going to touch it because of the climate change question. Are you going to quote a, a climate change denier? No. So why are we going to quote someone who's talking about birtherism? It was an actual discussion that they had, something they sent down from the top. And as a result of that, actually on the airwaves, if you're only listening to NPR, you probably had no idea what was going on, which as we just heard, was a huge motivator of 2016. So there's this really important balance to be clear about when you talk about it, that this, <laughs> that this is what it is, that it's not true and accurate. And then also sometimes you have to show it because it's even if something is completely untruthful if enough people think about it then it is newsworthy um and it, it, the the struggle is finding that balance in this media atmosphere that we have now where there's so much misinformation and disinformation and um just uh, to continue on i mean bias and and can we advocate or whatnot like that it, a lot of it goes down to what story are you working on? What's the angle you work on? You know, um, like you take Fox News, right? Fox News, they have their opinion. They have their news department too. The news department, it's all factual. But if you look at the assignments that they do, they're all, on, they're all over here, right? They, they're all basically factual things that put down Democrats. You look at, you know, a similar outlet on the left, say MSNBC, even though I don't think they're as flagrant, 
It's factual things that basically crap on the right. You know, like what our job to do in the best of terms is like merge those two things because there are two factual things at the same time, but depending how you weigh it, you're really putting your thumb on the scale. And at, at our best, we kind of do merge those, those two things. And, um, you know, and sometimes you just have to use common sense. Like sometimes you have to in, interpret what someone is, is saying and, uh, you know, do it in a good faith way. And it's a, it's a delicate balancing act, I would say. I know uh, for me, I believe in change but I also don't think it's my job as a journalist to decide what change needs to be taken place. Uh, I believe it's my job to truthfully report what is happening and leave it up for people to decide what direction we need to take going forward. So with that, I believe that, it, for example, what you brought up climate change, right? Talking to someone who is a climate change denier when there's not really any science to back it up, it, there's not really a point in in my view of the field, I think that we need to be purely factual about it, but that, that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to publish everybody, that we need to publish every belief, because there are dangerous beliefs, and that's often how these ideas can spread by even publishing, with them, publishing them with the best intentions, right? I think that we just need to be appropriately selective, make, making sure that what we do publish is factual and that there's grounds for it, and yeah. <laughs> I would say that it's important to def definitely hear both sides and not always publish both sides um, and make that journalistic decision as to whether or not you know there are dangerous beliefs um, but also you know making sure that you are at least giving time to listen to both sides before you write your story. I think sometimes and um, also um, here I'll tell you a real-time example of this phenomenon is uh, someone's trying to get me to write a story about this uh, possible new, there's like a next month and maybe the folks are coming back to the Capitol. There's some planned, but it still seems very small, whatever. And I was sitting there thinking like, with a story about this, is that indicting or is that amplifying, right? Right, do I, do I make it real by actually reporting? And I still think, and I think that the, it's situational. I think at this point, that answer is yes. Like, I don't think that there is evidence that this is widespread yet. I don't think that we know, you know, it's not having involvement from elected officials. I mean, and I think that sometimes you can, you, I need to see that level of kind of corroborate, corroboration before I feel that. Or I think your other option, kind of journalistically, is to make it really narrow, too. To not try to tell some big story. If I want to tell a story about one person going to that one rally, that's, I think that's a fine choice to make. But I think that you have to be very, um, I think that you do have to really weigh um, the, the, the cost of that. So um, you mentioned mass mandates. Of course, we're in, a, we're in a kind of a national battle over that here in Florida over, over uh, vaccines. You know, the governor said this week that cities and counties are going to be fined um, uh, millions of dollars potentially for requiring uh, employees to get vaccines. And I thought this was a, a good moment, though I know it's a bit of a hot potato, <laughs> to, to actually talk about it in view of Constitution Day, right? The Declaration of Independence says we have certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, I can argue that you know my right to live, if it's life, you know, is one is the first on the list. There means that people around me should be vaccinated, but maybe my neighbor will say that infringes upon her liberty. Um, so how should we be balancing individual rights and collective responsibility in this age? And I know that's a hard place to put you in <laughs> as a journalist. So if you, if you feel overwhelmed by that question, uh, that was in part um, sourced by uh, Professor Kevin Wagner. But we, I think you know, from the political science department, uh, they think big thoughts, which I love. I was a poli-sci major as an undergrad. But this, this, I think that it, there is a true tension between what we're in between those things, between individual rights and liberties and the collective responsibility right now. And, you know, is it a time to say, well, my body, my choice, or is it a time to say, you know, actually, we, we need to keep citizens alive and, 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 you know, therefore, you would subscribe to uh, what President Biden announced last week. So have at it, as he said. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I mean, it's fascinating, but, you know, like as a, as, a, as a culture, as a society, we like absolutes. I think we tend to like, is it this or is it that? And 
in almost every case, the Supreme Court has ruled on all these amendments to the Constitution that no, none of these rights is absolute. You can't, I can't yell fire in here and then cause a panic. That's like the classic example. That limits my right to freedom of speech. You know, um, with the, the Second Amendment, you have the right to bear arms, but it can be restricted in some circumstances. It's not absolute. Um, and, and in this case, it's, you know, in some, in some sense, we've already had this argument. We already had this argument in the, in the Supreme Court 100 years ago when they started having uh, vaccines for things like polio and whatnot. And they said, yeah, the, the government can make you have vaccines. It's for the good of everyone. You know, you have your right as, a, as an individual, but if, if, if you as an individual is going to put everyone at risk, you know, we have to side on the side of everyone. So in, in some way, we're like, we're reliving the past. And um, for some reason, a lot of people now feel like the current moment should be an exception to everything we've already agreed to. Everyone here had vaccines going to school going to, um, when we were growing up. Everyone. That's the world that we live in. And then now... You know, some people would have us believe that this is an exception. I mean, I, I, it's for the courts to decide, but that's that's where we are. I think that you know we have responsibility journalistically to say the facts about the vaccine, right? And I think that that should be true in our stories. Um, but you know, I, I you know I, I was mentioning how I was at the Marjorie Taylor Greene Matt Gates rally in Iowa, where unsurprisingly vaccines are not popular. And I and in that story, I think you have to do two things. You have to say. Um, you have to still make sure that even if you are um, mentioning what was popular at the rally, that you're saying the facts about what we know. And then also, though, but, you, but, I, but, I, I, but I think that the way it was working there, the vaccine mandates were playing into a larger argument of liberal excess, you know, that this was just another instance of the Dems gone too far. That's alongside critical race theory. That's alongside wokeness that's alongside voting rights expansion. And that, frankly, it fits within that same uh, argument piece. And so I would twist it a little from individual liberty because that really wasn't the argument I was hearing. I mean, certainly some folks make that. Um, it was more so that, you know, dictator Biden. It was about, it was about you know, uh, uh, another instance of the Dems have gone too far. Uh, just, just add something really quick because yesterday our governor DeSantis said you know cities and counties they can be fined if they force employees to to get vaccines an interesting thing is and this happened quietly but I was paying attention two weeks ago he gave them the thumbs up he said I don't like it if you want to make your municipal or county employees have vaccines I don't like it but if you want to do it have at it and then now it comes back and I think this is probably a question of you know, is the, is the tail wagging the dog or is the dog wagging the tail? Now he changed his tune. And in this, in this instance, I would probably venture to say it's probably the base of support that, that the governor has is telling him you need to put a stop to this. Um, but there has been a very clear back and forth. And I, I mean, we, we all need to recognize that we can have scientific debate and factual debate and whatnot, but this is political. There is spin that happens, and we need to all weigh that into how we talk about these things, how we report on these things, because everyone has a spin for everything. For us, as a very hyperlocal campus paper, we have, in this case, amplified voices on both sides of the aisle, taken an article and spoken to a variety of students, how do you feel about this? And I guess what we've done is if there's an issue with regard to you know, a student quoting perhaps a scientific fact or a reason for their opinion, that's when we would add you know, data and you know, scientific facts to clarify potentially in the article. But we, we have taken the opportunity to show it just kind of the overall tone of campus, which I think has been divided. With us focusing more on the black community, the vaccine has been a huge debate. So we have definitely tried to stay objective because like even on our own staff, we have a divide in opinions. So definitely just trying to report the science and also insert da data where, um, you know, where we find those students who might not be um, saying things that are always accurate. But, you know, even if, 
folks reasoning for not taking a vaccine isn't scientifically accurate. I think we do have a responsibility to talk about the, um, the, the very real reasons that some communities come to these skepticism, right? Like, and so I think that you, you can do all and not one or the other, where you are saying the facts, you are laying out the context, and you are also, you know, uh, uh, indicting misinformation. You know, I feel like, we, you know, the stories are going to have to deal in nuance because the issue still is nuance. Right. You, 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 you can't, you can't you, yeah, you, and you can't just like put people down like these people are dumb. These people don't like there are reasons why people have hesitancy. And a lot of that is very historical. There's there's very particular things that have happened in the past um, that have driven this skepticism. Um, so, uh, you know, us as public servants, I think if we can lay that all out and, and help people understand what's going on and what the realities of the current situation are now, then I think we're doing our jobs. I think we have time for maybe just one or two questions. We're not going to pass the mic around because of COVID, but I can, you know, if someone does have a question, I can take it and repeat it into the mic so people hearing from far away can ask it. Um, go ahead. There are there is a voting site at FAU during election time. Yes. Good. Is there another one out there? I'm blinded by the light. Yes, go ahead. Okay, in case anyone's listening from one of the other campuses, because we do have several campuses of FAU, I'll just in short repeat the question. Do you see um, differences, to use a poli sci word, cleavages within the Republican Party that go along demographics such as age? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the, the again, nuance, I mean, I feel like because Republicans have struggled more with young people, there is less division between older and younger because we're talking about the folks who stayed, right? Um, but we did see drop off from the Republican Party in, uh, in Trump era. That was particularly true, might not, maybe necessarily, it depends on how you're defining young, right? There's a huge difference when we talk about, this is true on the Democratic side too, like when you think of 40, I mean, when we think about young in politics, we should really think about like 40-ish and younger. And um, that's true on the Democratic side and the Republican side. When we think about the places where Trump was bleeding Republicans, that's a lot of the college-educated folks in that, um, in that sphere. But some of it's a self-fulfilling thing, right? There's less of a divide between the young people and the olds because they're, the, they're, they're some of the you know, outliers of young people who remain hardline Republicans. And so um, that's the kind of complicated answer, I would say. I would say uh, a, a shorter answer is that the biggest divide in the party to me is not generational, but is, is, is establishment to not, if we want to use the phrasing, is like, is, is elite to non-elite. It's not generational. Okay, well, I feel like, I, oh, oh, last question. Go ahead, you have to shout it. And please make it just concise, if you would, sir. Good language. question. Which, um, Good I mean, question. it's horrible. It's the core. I mean, I think, <laughs> I mean, like, um, when we talk about any type of local and state coverage, we have to start with the way that the industry has been decimated. I mean, even the path, I mean, I am young, and the path that is even open to, to, to me was completely decimated the local newspapers I read growing up. And I think that that changes the way people come to news for the first time. It's changed the trust in media. But more importantly, it's also changed the level of accountability that politicians receive. And so there is much, there, 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 are, there, are, there are a lot fewer places where politicians are being pushed because there is still not that robust 
ecosystem. There's also not that shared agreement of facts because we have a more self-selecting media ecosystem. And so in the absence of your local news, if you're doing what I'm doing, which is prioritizing Facebook groups, you're going to get a different type of news than you would have gotten on the other way. So um, I'm just retweeting what you said, but I agree. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, it's a huge issue. Um, you know, uh, one of my colleagues at the Miami Herald, Mary, Mary Ellen Kloss, um, has written pretty extensively about this. The less local reporting there is, the more impunity there is, the more public money is wasted, the more corruption happens, but people don't notice it because nobody's pouring through all the, the documents like they would be. And it erodes yep. public confidence in the governing process because you know, the, the, the reality of our governing system is that the government that actually most matters to you is the one where you live, right? It's the city at, or, or, or the town or whatever. And those are the same governments that are receiving less people looking at them. And um, so when those local governments start to falter because nobody is analyzing it, that's what drives a lot of um, you know, questioning and people don't trust the government because they're, they're not seeing it work on the local level. And then, you know, the reality is with our federalist system, the federal government probably has very little to do with, with your day-to-day -day life. It's what we talk about the most, but it has the, the, probably the least amount to do with it. Um, but when, when the, the distrust starts local, it goes all the way up and it, it, it goes up the chain. And it's, it's very unfortunate. Yeah, like Estelle was saying, there's less accountability there. I know I interned at a local paper this summer and it was a wonderful experience. I wrote multiple articles a week, and at the end of the summer, there was the conversation of, I want to keep you, but I, I can't pay you. I can't pay you to stay with us, and I can't pay you to help us keep this coverage, right? And you know, while I try to still contribute in my free time, there's still a dip in that coverage from when I was there, right? There are things that I would have been there to cover that are no longer going to be published, and it just creates a less informed community and it's much harder to keep these officials accountable when you can't put their work out in the open. Yes, I agree. I would say that more of our generation, at least, is more focused on the local. I mean, on the national news level, and they don't really focus on the local news. But that's where their focus should be. That's where the most change can happen. Right. I also think that like there is some belief among people that national, like you know, unfortunately, you know, places like the New York Times cannot make up that gap. I mean, it is not as if. We have the knowledge, the skill, the, the, the sourcing in these communities to swoop in and, and, and whatever. I mean, it is, it is not only um, making these communities worse. I think it makes the entire media ecosystem worse. Because as I was saying to um, you know, some of the uh, student journalists today, um, uh, I think my number one source of story ideas is reading local news, right? Like, I think that it is, um, it is a collective problem. We're all worse for it. You know, I work for a nonprofit media outlet, which is great, and I think there are starting to be some conversations about moving some kinds of local news to a nonprofit model, which I think would probably be best case scenario because a lot of local newspapers in the traditional model have found it yep. impossible to sustain themselves in that way. So there was, I think it was in Salt Lake City, but what, a big paper in, in Utah, I think, actually was the, the first major American paper that completely moved to a nonprofit model. And now it's doing better than it's done in a long time. There was a discussion when the Miami Herald just got sold, were they gonna go that route? It didn't go that route, but people are really starting to have these conversations because I think there's a growing recognition, not just in the public, not just people like us that are in the atmosphere, but Polit local politicians want people to cover it. They, they want this to make sure they're doing a good job for their communities. When I was at the Boston Globe, I was, as, as, for, as an intern, I sat in a pod of four people. And by the end of the summer of my internship, all, three of them had been laid off. Like it was, it was a, it is a consistent, it was a consistent, and that's a paper that is like financially doing better than a lot of other regional papers. And it is still really bleak. I think that's a, you know, it's, it's both a bleak point, but I think it's also um, an invitation to remind you to, you know, subscribe to your local newspaper, you know, don't expect to get all your journalism for free. Somebody has to pay our salaries, right? Somebody has to pay for, you know, the, the reporting trips that, that bring these issues to light, right? 
So, um, so I hope you do that, um, you know, or, or, you know, donate to your public radio station, you know, whether, whether this one or wherever you live. Um, and, um, you know, as I would like to kind of close it out now, I want to thank these four panelists, um, Ested and the three panelists, um, who have really shed a lot of light in addition to such a great talk um, that really helped us to unpack some of the issues that we're all struggling with. Um, so uh, let me say again, thank you to Daniel Rivera from WLRN and Jillian Manning from the University Press and to Kennedy McKinney from the Paradigm Press and uh, as well as being president of the Black Student Union. Um, once again, Ested, thank you so much. I think I'm, I'm going to be now handing it over to Professor Kevin Wagner, but I want to just say my words of, um, of you know, great gratitude for your being here today and helping us um, you know, see a little more clearly what's really happening. Thank you to all of you. Thanks. I just want to thank the panel for their participation and everyone for their, uh, their excellent questions. Uh, the questions really uh, do make the panel and, and, uh, and give us some sense of uh, some of the broader questions that you have. Um, we're almost done. I just want to take a quick moment. I want to, thank, I want to introduce uh, 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 Lindsay Goldstein from the uh, Students Advocating Volunteer Involvement Office. Lindsay, are you here? Okay. Come on up. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. And um, so just this is about Constitution Day, but I want to do a quick plug for the next civic holiday, uh, which is actually going to be National Voter Registration Day. Does anyone know when that is? No. Okay, that's over here, right? So it's going to be September 28th. Um, so we're raising awareness about that. It's National Voter Registration Day. We will be doing voter registration out in front of the student union. Um, you know, for the students in the room, we know you all love free shirts, so you can get a year of Voice Matters shirt, coming out and get that. We'll be doing uh, trivia relating to voting. Um, so I have a quick sample of a trivia question, see if you guys know it. We'll get it to a question in the audience, but just to mark your calendars for the next uh, civic holiday, which is National Voter Registration Day. We talk a lot about local uh, voting. Um, so your most local is your student government. For the students in the room, does anyone know the student government president's name? Or anyone in student government? We name a student government representation and we can get you a shirt. Hand? Yes? Oh. Yay! Wonderful. Yes, Max Simonson. So great. Thanks for the shout out there. We'll get you a shirt. And when is National Voter Registration Day? September 28th. September 28th. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, definitely uh, value all of our civic holidays here. Uh, I want to remind everyone that uh, Constitution Day is not a one-day event here at FAU. We have lots of great events. If you, uh, if you missed it on Monday, we had a really good event for, uh, on the judicial branch and exercising your, your right to vote. We had uh, Judge Rowe, uh, Judge Weiss, and uh, Judge May from the 4th District Court of Appeal, and it's a good event. It's uh, available if, if you go to the Jack Miller Forum. You can, uh, you can re-watch the video from it. Uh, we also have some great events on the, uh, the Davie campus, including Friday we're going to have movie night with National Treasure celebrating Constitution Day with a fun historical perspective on the feature film National Treasure. So that is good. And next week, uh, we are going to have the inaugural, the inaugural um, social uh, breezeway dialogues here at FAU, which is an attempt to uh, create civil discourse through, uh, um, through a civil conversation. So the... The debate is going to be uh, individual freedoms over collective responsibility, which is something we just talked about here on this panel. Um, you can find more information about that at the Jack Miller Forum Constitution Day page. Just Google Jack Miller FAU and Constitution Day, and uh, uh, we definitely encourage you to come. Uh, I want to, again, thank our panel, thank our keynote speaker, Asted. This was a fantastic panel. I know uh, I appreciate everyone that came out here. I know it's difficult to come in-person events in, uh, in the pandemic age, and for everybody watching on the stream, I hope you enjoyed it as well. This completes our program, and I thank everybody for attending. You did good. Thank you. You have a natural moderator ability, I gotta say. Thank you very, very much. Very good job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, yeah, I, oh, wait, I think are those yours or is that mine? This is mine. That's yours. Okay. That's yours. Wait, hold on. Wait, some of these that's some yours. Of them are mine. I think the bottom.